Hello everyone. Today I'm delighted uh, to be talking with Dr. C. D. Moiti, the WHO Regional Director for Africa. Uh, at the recent annual general meeting of Offland, where I spoke about cervical cancer and the Global HPV Consortium, Dr. Moiti and they decided uh, to join hands to take this movement forward. Uh, as a result, the Global HPV Consortium is co-hosting with Dr. Moite's uh, guidance and leadership an event on cervical cancer elimination in Africa at the WHO Africa Regional Meeting in August. Welcome Dr. Moite, and so delighted and excited to be working on this important public health and also women's health uh, priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anulada. It's, it's great to see you again, and, and uh, I'm so glad to join this movement and this effort. I'm very excited about it. Thank you, Dr. Moiti. Uh, would you share with us and our audience what keeps you awake at night about the situation with cervical cancer in Africa? And may I ask what inspired you to collaborate with the Global HPV Consortium? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I think what, what keeps me awake, awake, of course, is that the burden, the huge burden of, of uh, cervical cancer in Africa is worse than any other part of the world. You know, 18 out of the 20 countries with the highest burden are in Africa and probably sub-Saharan Africa. And it's the number one killer, cancer killer of African women. So that's what keeps me awake at night. And then on the other hand, is the fact that there is such a huge opportunity to do something about it. You, you know, I mean, if I just tell a personal story, I've had a 40-year-old cousin die of breast cancer several years ago. And today her mother, my aunt, has breast cancer, which has spread to her lungs and her bones. And, you know, we, we know what that means. Whereas the story with cervical cancer, can be so different. That's what, in a way, spurs me to be very determined to do something about it and also excites me about the opportunity and the fact that things progress in the region to leverage those opportunities is moving slowly. It needs to speed up. And that's what I would like to take the opportunity to do in my position and with, with access to, to decision makers in the countries and to partners. So thank you for your leadership, Dr. Moiti. And, and I do recall our conversation at the annual general assembly of the Offland, where you were so uh, excited uh, to join hands with the Global HPV Consortium. So may I ask you, what is it that struck you about the approach that we have taken at the Global HPV Consortium and, and also organize with us this important event at the upcoming regional committee meeting where African health ministers will be in attendance besides many of our partners. And what are you hoping we will be able to achieve? I, I think what, what spurred me on and what encourages me a lot is the opportunities. The opportunities in several senses and therefore the, the imperative to leverage those opportunities, to take advantage of them, to make the impact that's, that's so needed uh, for women. I mean, first of all, I think is the opportunity, just as a reminder, sometimes in Africa, there are so many competing um, health problems that uh, areas where there is opportunity to actually do something transformative might be overlooked. So I think it's our, it's our responsibility to provide that reminder and have, you know, a conversation that may be challenging, but that's also positive because there's a huge opportunity in terms of what's happening, the tools that are available, some of the programmatic and service delivery and service access opportunities that already exist. First of all, there's a vaccine. And secondly, there is advice from the regional technical advisory group on immunization that actually we can vaccinate girls once, and that will be offering, uh, you know, protection for them lifelong. 
Meanwhile, we've seen that, you know, in, in, in the past, several years ago, 10 years ago, so I was a director of non-communicable diseases, actually. And I remember with my colleagues making an effort to work together across the immunization programs, across the women's health program, to organize a joint effort to, to move this agenda ahead. And at that time, there were vaccine shortage issues. We needed to deal with our boundaries and vertical ways of working and, and kind of who owns this, who's going to drive this. That's one. I think we have moved quite a lot in the discussions in the region about more primary health care, health sims related approaches to many things, including the fact that the global health initiatives have now the Lusaka agenda. Those who are financing hugely have recognized the value of making connections. And then secondly, and very importantly for, for our region, which bears the heaviest burden of uh, cervical cancer and also the heaviest burden of HIV, is the connection to HIV, both in terms of vulnerability, of developing um, cervical cancer and, and of that advancing, and because of the opportunity. We've had HIV programs in place in most of the countries, in, you know, for, for, for decades. And again, I come from that background. I was at some point the HIV regional advisor for WHO, as well as being the person in charge of the HIV program in the world's worst affected country at that time, my country, Botswana. So I think the opportunity to combine access to services for screening and for um, early detection we're using hopefully more effective tests that are available that exists around incorporating um, cervical cancer interventions into existing HIV services is simply too huge to let go. That's what I find most exciting. So it's not a starting from scratch with a new program in the traditional vertical way of working, but it's in the same women in the same communities, which are already sensitized and hopefully mobilized, you know, just highlighting this issue, incorporating into what's already going on, what's needed to address the, the cervical cancer component and achieving results that will enable even if women do have cancer, then to have uh, testing that allows early intervention and saves women's lives. So I, it's just too great an opportunity to be missed. And that's what makes me feel encouraged that it's doable and it's something that one can join a partnership that's interested in working on. Thank you, Dr. Moiti, and thank you for highlighting the nexus between HPV and, and HIV, which is particularly relevant in the context of uh, Africa. And that is why uh, we have been very steadfast in uh, shining spotlight on, on the vulnerability of women living with HIV uh, for, for cervical cancer and how cervical cancer in the case of women living with HIV is pretty much a death uh, sentence. And, and therefore, uh, for cervical cancer prevention and eventual elimination, it's not just vac vaccination, which is, of course, the most important and essential first step, but it's also integration of screening and, and treatment, particularly of precancerous uh, lesions that will really take us uh, towards the goal that, that we have jointly set, which is, which is to eliminate cervical cancer. So my sort of, uh, sort of question to you is that through this event, right, the, the intention is really to generate uh, momentum around cervical cancer and in particular, mobilize political will and, and, and also all the partners who, who are working in the ecosystem, be it vaccination or, or screening or HIV or reproductive health. So bringing them all together, right? But what uh, do you think are some of the potential barriers that will arise going forward as we start to execute the plan on the ground? Yes, I, I mean, I, I think first and foremost, you know, the, um, the culture of working in certain vertical ways linked to funding coming from a particular source and in a way recreating for different programs our own health system right down to the village level is still very strongly in place. 
we are discussing it in Africa, and and I'm I'm expecting that we will need to have discussions, certainly with the ministers of health. This is a huge opportunity to have them all in the room, and in 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 a way, tell them some good news, some potential good news based on the policy actions that they take, based on the interaction that they have with the funders. Because very often what is driving verticality is the way programs are supported and funded, but also based on their own knowledge and leadership in how the health systems for which they are responsible are managed, are structured, are controlled. So they are you know, uniquely placed if we sensitize them, if they understand and accept to take on this way of working and to take on the advocacy, the leadership, not only with the partners at the political level in countries, going right down to the local level within their health systems and the, 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 the connection of the investment. So I think the ministers, it's very important. And then, as you said, the partners as well. So we'll have partners who work on a range of areas on vaccination, on the prevention of, of HIV, clearly HIV prevention and treatment, on uh, non-communicable diseases. We've made some move around non-communicable disease. So partners who are supporting across all of this. And most importantly, those that are working on universal health coverage and health systems. Because this is a way of saying, you know, if, if you're delivering an essential package to women of reproductive age or sexually active age, this is a way in which to deliver part of the package that's been missing by adding these elements that address the, those cervical cancer diagnosis and, uh, and treatment. And, and very importantly, hopefully as well, getting this out in, in terms of communication to the wider world so that those partners who may be concerned about cervical cancer see an opportunity if there is a link with ongoing systems that have been invested in by other partners to, to address what's needed for for, for, for cervical cancer. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Moiti, for those observations. The kind of stigma that uh, HIV encountered, you know, for a long time uh, is also the stigma that we are seeing with regard to HPV and cervical cancer. And let me turn your attention to the recent study of 600 physicians in Malaysia, which found that one in five uh, physicians blamed their patients for their condition. And, and one in eight felt an HPV diagnosis indicated promiscuous behavior. Uh, does this finding surprise you? In a way, it doesn't, but it, it disappoints me deeply and it challenges me as well. You know, it, 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 it's so much like going back 30 years, 20 years, and not not only with members of the public, people in general, but particularly with with uh, with healthcare workers. You know, I, <laughs> sorry to tell a long story. I remember being a, a twenty year old medical student intending to go on the pill in London. So I went to a clinic, and by some luck, I met a, a Irish Catholic doctor. You know, it took a lot of courage to actually go into the clinic. So I wanted to go on the pill as a young black student in London. I got a lecture on religion and morality and the recommendation to go find my pill elsewhere. I couldn't believe it. In London, just right next to, Red, to, to King's Cross. And if you look at what's happening generally in the world today in terms of attitudes to women's, women's rights, women's access to services of various types, including, shockingly, in, in very developed countries, we are seeing and I'm sure you've heard about some of the um, developments around uh, sexuality at the political level. And this goes right down to professionals who I suppose are part of the society and who, in my view, we need to find ways to help to understand so that they create an environment which will enable the women to be willing to come forward. So it is shocking. Clearly, we need to work with professional associations, you know, those groups, groups of doctors. I'm on several WhatsApp groups with young doctors in my own country, Busana, who are working on public health. So those kinds of people who can influence each other and who can adopt as peers 
or not help change these attitudes, young people, other influencers, ourselves as professional organizations, so that people really do look at the woman. I mean, one, one just got so used to seeing this when particularly one was looking at sex workers and their access to services and the fact that at the, the, particularly at the start of the, of the HIV pandemic, including up to now, they're particularly at risk and have high rates of prevalence and the kind, kinds of treatment they went through. Yeah, very well said. And um, for HPV, we have been very focused on addressing parental attitudes because there has been a lot of evidence uh, to suggest that parents uh, get worried about HPV vaccine encouraging promiscuity. Uh, but but we this kind of finding uh, about professionals themselves and about doctors and physicians uh, harboring the same kind of misperception is indeed uh, very disappointing, but also highlights the importance, as you rightly said, to address the full range of influencers because they, can, they, they all tend to be gatekeepers and can exert a very strong uh, influence on, on the uptake of uh, services, be it uh, vaccination or screening or, or any treatment. Uh, so Dr. Moiti, we at Sabine are so excited to be working with your team at WHO Africa to support three African nations. We had agreed to take this whole regional conversation into country level action. So the three countries that have been selected are Niger, Madagascar, and Uganda. Uh, to create uh, cervical cancer elimination plans under the leadership of, of the governments. Uh, can you please uh, elaborate on this initiative, uh, including uh, just telling the audience about the criteria that, that uh, was adopted for the selection of these countries? Yes. I, I, I mean, it's, it's very interesting that these are three such different countries. You know, one is... Uh, one country in the in the northern part in in, in Western Africa, one is Uganda, uh, a country that's well established in terms of the HIV response uh, health system that's being invested in. Another one is is, is Madagascar, large large island state, as they always like, insist on being called called when we talk about small island states. I I, I mean I think we we looked my my colleagues looked at several things. So is there a uh, is the data available? Is there registration, a register available in the country that's going to help with uh, with some of this work? Is there some capacity in place, such as uh, diagnostic labor laboratory capacity? Is there um, right. is there a willingness? I, I think some of the um, so some of the some of the issues is okay. Is there cancer policy in the country? Is there a framework around which it's legitimate to to prioritize? cervical cancer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moiti. All very valid considerations, but I do want to again uh, reiterate the importance of heterogeneity that, that you just highlighted. Mm -hmm. These three countries are very different, yeah. and we have been constantly advocating that one size fits all approach mm -hmm. must be shunned in favor of more tailored, targeted, contextualized strategies. So really going to countries, three countries, which look very different, you know, will actually uh, give us a much better understanding of mm -hmm. the different and diverse needs of these countries and how the plans in these countries could look quite uh, quite distinct and, and dissimilar. Mm -hmm. So a lot of learning uh, might really come from these exemplars. Uh, thank you for, for sharing this. Uh, so just uh, one more thing on my mind is that if you could do just that one thing to eliminate cervical cancer in Africa, what would that be? What would you focus on first and, and foremost? That, that's such a tough question to answer for the, 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 <laughs> the one thing. I mean, I, I, think, I think I would focus on <clears throat> the promise of the vaccine and getting that out to girls at an age when there were lots of concerns, I recall, when we were, you know, fiddling around with adolescent girls is a very sensitive issue as well in our societies, in, in countries. And it needed a lot of discussion, convincing that this is needed and this is not trying to exploit them. So, so uh, you know, hard choice to make, understanding that the existing prevalence. But I think that is because we, we, we see that the, um, the coverage in the region still has a long way to go. So how we can 
focus on that, make people understand it's at a certain point in a child's life before they become sexually active, we hope, and it's a one shot and we need to do all that we can with the education systems, with the adolescent health systems, uh, with the partners that are concerned, very much involved and experienced in vaccination to get that uh, get that done, increase the coverage. And, and that also then has all these elements we're talking about, acceptance at the community level, at the local level, so that in families, people find it okay for their school going, hopefully, child to, 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 to be given this vaccine. And then of course, um, access to, to the supplies of vaccine that, that, that are needed. It's very difficult to make the choice of one thing. I mean, I would love to yeah, be able but to- very important. Well. Yeah, but yeah. you have made a very important uh, observation, and that is how do we make sure we fully reap the benefits of a highly promising vaccine and that itself can become a test case in terms of uptake. And, and as you rightly said, uh, coverage uh, of HPV vaccination in countries uh, still is lagging. So we have seen a lot of momentum building around new vaccine introductions, but sustaining high coverage, getting to high, high coverage, and then sustaining it continues to be a challenge. And that the recent unique estimates are showing that the coverage both in high income countries and, and also low and middle income countries is still trending below the pre pandemic levels at 59 and 65% uh, globally, but also Africa, you have highlighted that challenge. So a lot of work lies ahead. So, Dr. Moiti, one unique thing about Africa is that it has a, a growing uh, proportion of young population. And would you uh, share your thoughts on the role? that African youth can play in HPV prevention and cervical cancer elimination. And can you share with us some good inspiring examples of youth engagement in this area? Now, Africa's youth for me is, the, the young population is one of the most exciting aspects of African life. So much potential, so much um, if you like leapfrogging, leapfrogging many things in, in the continent in terms of how they are connected into technology, that, that, that opportunity for young people to be in touch with each other very much because they live in Africa, but they live in the whole world through their, connect, their connectedness to what's going on everywhere. So I, I, I think, and they are very much now, unlike some of us at our age, in the habit of being in touch and being in communication constantly. This is what part of what they do uh, a lot of in, 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 in their lives. So I, I think that the, the potential for finding youth influencers, youth leaders, youth who mobilize others to get informed, not only get informed, but do something about, about this for themselves, in their families, in their communities, even addressing the elders, in my view, even challenging the elders. You know, we were, we're seeing that more and more in, in, in countries that our youths are straddling the whole world in terms of their engagement and their understanding of um, the culture, the norms, the needs to be, you know, our culture be respectful to elders, but also connected to the rest of the world in, in, in terms of what needs to happen for good information to get around that has an outcome. So I think there are really huge um, resource, a very exciting resource. In the past, I've worked on peer education and adolescent health in UNICEF, in fact, and, and what young people can do with each other, for each other, and for their families as well, in, in terms of contact with, with elders and, and with the system is amazing. So I, I think the potential there is really amazing. Truly, and that is why I think amplifying the role of uh, the youth and adolescents is going to be so critical. You know, as as we try and combat some of these public health challenges. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Moiti, for speaking to us and sharing such uh, valuable uh, insights and unique perspectives with our audience. You bring a wealth of experience. You know, you have worked on the ground in a country like Botswana, where you know HIV rates you know, have been very high. 
and who have worked with those communities on HIV and really sort of confronted many of these challenges firsthand. And and I'm sure our audience uh, would would uh, you know would have uh, gotten so much out of this conversation that will hold them in very good stead. So thank you so much, and thank you for for the partnership with Sabine and the Global HPV Consortium. No, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I mean, as I said, this is such a, a hopeful endeavor, in my view, and and I think it, it you know it, it it's it's so encouraging to know that if we do this, it'll help the result that we want and it, it'll be a, a lasting result. And that for me is, is what inspires me to, to wish to be part of it. And, and as I said again, the connection component. Now you don't have to start from scratch. There doesn't need to be a global fund created for this. And if we work together across boundaries, because that's a principle that works not only for cervical cancer and HIV, but for many of the health interventions. So if this could be a model and an example and an inspiration for being having the courage to make these connections across funding models, agencies, departments, teams and countries, that for me would also be an additional value added apart from the objective itself, of course, of addressing cervical cancer. Thank you, Dr. Moiti. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And see you soon.